While leading his military team on patrol in Afghanistan in 2012, our next guest was shot in the spine and instantly paralyzed during an intense gun battle. At that moment, Derek Herrera's life as a Marine Special Operations Officer took a dramatic yet innovative turn that is helping others live more healthy and whole lives through his work as an industry-leading medical device entrepreneur. While together, Derek shares his journey of becoming a passionate and dedicated medical technology founder and executive after his injury and why he is uniquely positioned to create devices suited for the needs of others like him. Additionally, Derek and I discuss how he has given back to our communities across the nation by uplifting other veterans to explore and secure professional career opportunities in the life science, medical device, and health technology sectors. I am honored to welcome one of our nation's heroes onto this podcast, and I can't wait for you to get to know this inspiring servant leader that has dedicated his life's work to healthcare innovation. Let's go. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Hi, Derek. Welcome to our podcast. It's such an honor to spend time with you today. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm grateful to have this conversation. Given your service to our nation while in the military, as well as what you're building as a private citizen that is making an immeasurable impact on so many lives. But before we discuss all of this work and mission that you are on to help others, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. You will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Lastly, please visit the bottom of the episode notes to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Clubhouse in order to further the conversations occurring on this podcast. All right, Derek, it's almost time for our community to learn how you created EuroDev Medical after being injured while serving as a Marine Raider in Afghanistan, as well as how you're assisting and preparing to transition service members and military veterans for meaningful employment in the medical device and life science industries. Wow, we have a lot to cover today. But first, I'm going to randomly select an icebreaker question so we can get to know you. Let's see what we're going to discuss here. All right, Derek. Now, I know you're a serial entrepreneur. I get it. It's usually a lifestyle, not a job, right? I'm one of those as well. But what is that one thing you love to do outside of building businesses and your entrepreneurial pursuits? The one thing I'd love to do is spend time with my family. So I have a wife, uh, twin boys that are three and a half and a lot of fun (laughs) and a dog. Twin boys, three and a half. That sounds like a full on startup just by itself. Yeah. We were thrust into chaos that could never have been predicted uh, (laughs) for first time parents, right? Twin boys. So that's awesome. Yeah, they're good. Oh, how cool. I wasn't raised around uh, twins. I actually didn't know a lot growing up. So I'll ask you as a father. Can you definitely tell personality differences? I mean, is there distinct differences between the boys? Absolutely. Yeah. Immediately from day one, right? It was a little bit uncanny and actually surprised both of us. That's so cool. Were you guys surprised that twins were coming? No, we knew pretty early on. I think from the very first test, the lab results were pretty elevated and it was, oh, well, these numbers are triple what they're supposed to be. (laughs) You might be having twins. We're like, oh, okay. So, and then sure enough, they confirmed it and yeah, it was good. Oh, that's awesome somewhat prepared, or at least we're able to think about it mentally and emotionally. It wasn't a surprise. I love it. Twin boys, three and a half while building companies to help move healthcare forward. Unbelievable. We can end the podcast now. Complete (laughs) unbelievable (laughs) admiration for you, Derek. Thank you for sharing a bit about you and your family and your boys. And I'm eager to discuss your impact-driven pursuits and mission with all of your initiatives after we get back from thanking our community champion sponsor. With rising burnout, malpractice, digital and personal risks, clinicians face greater than a million dollar liability. And in today's climate, busy frontline healthcare workers don't have the capacity to attend to these risky blind spots. But the AdaptTrack team is bringing hope and solutions to the healthcare industry. AdaptTrack's mission is to help clinicians and their practice teams work and live better. AdaptTrack's 30 second nudges unlock category one continuing medical education credits 
along with insurance savings while meeting the busy clinician where they are. On Clubhouse, during weekend nature walks, through all of helps from this podcast and over 3,000 additional work-life moments. To learn more about Adapt Track and how you can engage in active learning that drives a 5X plus ROI, a 30X time savings, and an experience clinicians will love, head over to adapttrack.com or visit the top of the episode notes and click on their link. All right, we are back with Derek Herrera, CTO of Eurodev Medical and President and Chairman of MedTech Vets. Derek, wow, this could be a series of podcast episodes. We have a lot to cover today. And what I love about entrepreneurs and the ones that really excel are the ones that find a problem and go and solve for it as opposed to building something and then trying to find a home for it. And you are literally that prime example of what you went through personally while serving our nation. Derek, before we dive into Eurodev Medical, as well as some upcoming startups that you're already working on to solve for problems at hand that you and others have personally experienced, and then, of course, helping our veterans place them into awesome roles within healthcare and life sciences, digital health, medical device. Take us back a little bit to that story of how this all began, serving our nation. Take us to those moments, and then we'll springboard into current state with your amazing organizations. Sure thing. Grew up in a military family that was always the family business, for lack of a better term. Went to college at the Naval Academy and became a Marine officer shortly upon graduation. Served for me an infantry officer for a few years and then had such a great time that I knew that I wanted to stay in the Marine Corps and serve in the special operations community. And so went through training and became a Marine Raider, which is kind of like a Navy SEAL, but better looking and smarter and faster <laughs> and lift more weights. And took over a small team of 20 Marines and sailors as a Marine Raider team commander. In 2011, started preparing for deployment to Afghanistan and found myself leading this team in Afghanistan in 2012. And so our mission was to conduct something called village stability operations. And so our team was embedded in a small local village in rural Afghanistan in the Helmand province. And our mission was to try to establish security, revive economic development, and link the political governance from the local levels to the district and national levels. And so unfortunately where we were, it was incredibly chaotic and found ourselves in engaging in combat operations frequently with Taliban fighters. And on one of the patrols we were conducting, we occupied a building shortly after sunrise in June of 2012. After the opening moments of a firefight, myself and two other Marines were on the rooftop of this building that we were occupying and got engaged from our flank. And the Marine to my left had been shot through the neck and I'd gotten shot through my left shoulder where the bullet traveled into my spine, lodging between my T6 and T7 vertebrae. So I was instantly paralyzed from the chest down and have been since that day, but immediately took action to try to treat myself. My team rapidly started conducting the actions necessary to repel the enemy assault, keep us alive, both myself and the other Marine who had been shot and get us on the helicopter. And due to their heroism, their bravery and selflessness, we're both here today. My colleague who was shot to the neck actually made a full recovery, doing phenomenal and I've recovered quite well as well, despite still using a wheelchair and, and being paralyzed from the chest down. And so that's what occurred in June and in an instant changed my life because I could no longer serve as a Marine Raider and perform the profession that I dedicated my life to up until that point. Wow, that's powerful. And Derek, one thing that we focus on quite a bit with this podcast, and I have a personal huge passion around it, is to bring mental health and well-being out of the dark corners of our lives and shine a light on it. It's important. And so I want to ask you through that experience, right? Here you are training, dedicating your life to it, giving every fiber of your being to this, and then this horrific incident happens. What was that like on the other side for you? And we're going to get into all the amazing organizations that you've helped lead and you're building and getting ready to launch even more. But before we go there, just because I have to ask it, what is it like on the other side of an event like that of course, physically devastating, but how was it for you mentally? Yeah, it was a range of emotions, just like anyone would expect or experience. And some of it was good. Some of it was bad for me. I think I was very fortunate though. I was in a combat zone. I knew this was an eventuality that could have happened, right? I could have been shot at any time or, or blown up by an IED or explosive device. This was our job, right? We were trained for this. And so that helped a lot, I think. And then in the initial stages of recovery one, I was just kind of happy to be alive, right? I was euphoric that I had survived this situation because it could have been much worse. So I had this initial state of 
joy to be alive. And then the doctors, you know, they knew my injury was serious, but what they said, instead of what most people hear, which is you're paralyzed, you'll never walk again. What they told me was, Hey, you're paralyzed, but we don't really know what's going to happen. Right. The research shows that you may recover some things you may not, but if something happens, most likely the research shows it'll happen in the first two years. And so they left me a glimmer of hope and a little bit of positivity, which was good and helped me through those initial stages where I was still fighting for my life, essentially with a chest tube because I had trauma to my chest and my lungs, all of the things to deal with my arm. I couldn't use my left arm at that time because I'd been shot through the scapula and, and everything else. And it left me an opportunity to look positively at the situation, which was good. But over time, probably two months in when things started to stabilize and I still wasn't recovering function, the reality started to set in that this could be permanent or more permanent than I thought it would have been. And that was really difficult to deal with along with the fact that I was one month in about six weeks into a deployment that was supposed to be seven months long. And I was in charge of this team that was out there still in harm's way. And I had no ability to influence the outcome of whether they survived or not. And all the things that they were going through to continue to conduct operations on our nation's behalf. And so that for me was terrible. There's no other way around it. And it was devastating psychologically. It was lonely, right? Even though my wife was there with me and relocated to Tampa, Florida to the VA hospital where I was recovering and she was amazing. It was tough. It was so hard to deal with. So over time, there was a lot of strife and struggles, but probably about a year after I'd gotten injured, I started to question some of the assumptions that I had made about myself and about my situation. And I realized that, yes, I'd become fragile and I was going through this process, but there was still so much that I could do, right? And there were so many opportunities that I had and things that I never would have dreamed were possible that I can still do, right? Despite being paralyzed. And so I kind of had this realization that I was limiting myself and squandering opportunities. And that also coincided with a realization that some of my friends, unfortunately, who'd been killed in Afghanistan and didn't make it home, made it very easy for me to appreciate every day the opportunity that I have. And so every day I think is an opportunity. It's a choice, right? To go forward and live your life in a way that you should be proud of. And knowing that any one of my brothers in arms would be happy to be in my situation and to be alive makes it really easy for me to stop feeling sorry for myself and go forward and take advantage and appreciate everything that I have and all the gifts and the talents that I still have. And so that was a really challenging time in mental health. I'm really glad you asked that question because I think it's something everybody experiences. And that's one of the beauties of the human condition, right? Is not just people in the military, it's humans, right? Humans experience trauma, loss, and suffering, and it all manifests itself the same way physically, psychologically, neurochemically. Those same feelings are all valid amongst people and we all experience them. And unfortunately, I think only recently are we starting to really talk about these issues and make it okay to discuss mental health, which is good. Well, and thank you for being real and bringing the authenticity as well, Derek, because I agree 100%. We need to create some safe spaces. We as leaders need to be at the forefront of bringing it to light. And I appreciate your authenticity to share because it is difficult at times, but the more we start speaking about it and normalizing it, as you said, that I know we can continue to move the mental health and well-being of our communities forward. And thank you for sharing just that background, how powerful and literal definition of servant leader when you were sharing how you were feeling while in Tampa with your team over on the other side of the world. Unbelievable. I am literally ready to run through walls for you right now, Derek. I'm ready to go. Man, unbelievable. Thank you for sharing that. But now let's talk about the art of the pivot, right? There you were. You grew up in a family of military family members. This was in your blood. This is who you were. This is what the family devoted themselves to. This devastating injury. And there you were. What's next, right? Did you know that you had it in you to be a technology founder and entrepreneur to launch devices, to launch companies within? healthcare technology and innovation. Give us a little bit of that art of the pivot of where that started coming into focus. And we'll start talking about Eurodev Medical, as well as some of the things that's on the horizon. You got some other tricks up the sleeve. I can't wait to share a bit on that. And then of course, what you're doing to give back as well with your MedTech Vets organization. But let's go to that art of the pivot. Give us a little bit of view into that, of pivoting from yeah. your military career into being a very successful entrepreneur. Yeah. So once I started to realize that this was more permanent situation than I'd initially thought. I just had a lot of time on my hands, right? I was sitting around doing nothing and just started figuring out and planning what I should do or where I should go or try to figure out. And so my goals were to get back to work as quickly as possible. And then as a backup plan, I started applying to graduate school right away. So I think I did my first B-school interview 
three months after I got injured and just started applying. Right. Cause I kind of looked and I was like, well, I have this skill set, this leadership experience. I had an undergraduate degree in engineering, but what can I do to try to prepare myself better for my next mission or find my next mission, even at that point? Cause I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to be. And so I looked at law school and didn't want to do that. The medical school, same thing. And had some friends that were, had gotten out of the military earlier than me and were at business school. And they're like, yeah, it's versatile. It's good. It's fun. You should check it out, man. And so I started looking, applied to a few different schools, found the one that fit my needs best. And so I started UCLA at the executive MBA program in 2013, about 13 months after I got injured and started going back to school while I was working at the battalion that I was assigned at as a staff officer. And so started doing that. All the while I was researching medical technology for my own needs and trying to become an expert in every aspect of spinal cord injury recovery and spinal cord injury research, everything from stem cells to exoskeletons to crazy things like bee sting therapy and whatever. I looked at everything. And that's something we learn as Marine Raiders and special operators is just to be quick learners, right? And to be critical thinkers and problem solvers and to, to try to become experts overnight. So I tried to become an expert in spinal cord injury research and recovery overnight. And in doing so, one of the companies I got involved with as a user was Rewalk Robotics, which makes exoskeleton that enables people who are paralyzed to stand and walk again. This device was really impactful for me, not just because I could stand and walk again, but because it represented something so much more fundamentally impactful and life-changing for me. When I retired from the military in 2014, I was able to do so without using a wheelchair. And I'm still completely paralyzed, but because of this device, I was able to accomplish that. And that was only a result of technology. And the technology was developed by someone just like me. It was a quadriplegic, someone from Israel, from the Israel Institute of Technology, the Technion University there. And I'd had the opportunity to meet with this guy. And he just started in his garage, just building and hacking and putting this stuff together. And then over the course of 10 years, it's now a public company and they had FDA clearance for this device that is now life-changing. And so with that experience, I developed a little bit of chutzpah and a healthy lack of risk aversion and just decided to go for it, right? And identified so many unmet needs that could be solved with technology and understood that I should be the person to do it, right? Because I'm the only one who knows and deals with this firsthand and then no one should be more motivated to accomplish this than me. While I was at business school, I was trying to figure this out and develop the plans and understand exactly how this would manifest itself and ask myself a pretty simple question, which was of all the things I could do, is there something that only I can do? And that was what I came to was I want to leverage my injury and turn it into an advantage, a competitive advantage and design products that I would use and that other people just like me would use. And that can be our strategic advantage as a business is to develop products for people like me and to communicate and bring them to market in a way that's profitable and sustainable as a for-profit corporation. And that was kind of the realization I had while I was at business school, started to take action to make that a reality and developed the business plans, did all the things that that need to happen to build a company and found a company. And then when I graduated, it started pursuing EuroDev Medical full-time. I love it. And again, I know you have a couple others you're going to share here in just a moment, but let's focus in on EuroDev Medical. You guys have been at it for now almost six years, as well as I do, that valley of death for new startups. It's usually, if you can get past year two or three, there's a good opportunity to have that company take flight, if you will. And you guys are now, again, almost six years into this. It's awesome. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It should be celebrated. But let's talk about what have you guys been up to at EuroDev Medical? Where are you at now? And where do you think you see things heading with, with the technology, with the organization? What have you built there at EuroDev Medical? Yeah. So what we've built at EuroDev Medical is the first fully internal, wirelessly controlled bladder management system for men with urinary retention. And so this device is a smart catheter that can go inside the body and stay there for an extended period of time and can be remotely operated to control emptying of the bladder for men who've lost control of their bladder. And so this was a major issue that I dealt with firsthand was bladder management. And the best thing that medicine had to offer was intermittent disposable one-time use catheters. So every time you go to the bathroom, pull out a catheter, insert it in your bladder, drain your bladder and throw it away, right? So every time you're at risk of complications, urethral trauma, urinary tract infections, And then on the insurer side, every time I go to the bathroom, it costs them five bucks, right? And so as someone who's 28 years old, faced with this prospect of doing this for the rest of my life, I thought there had to be a better way and became obsessed with solving this problem. And that's what we've built. And at six years is a long time. Yeah, it's been a labor of love and a grind for sure. We started with nothing. So we were technology agnostic in that regard. And we were just focused on solving a problem. And so after surveying the landscape, 
I had an idea of how we wanted to solve this issue, but we were starting from zero, right? No patents, no technology, no intellectual property, no devices, no prototypes. We had a drawing, literally pencil and paper, because I still didn't even know how to do CAD modeling at that time. Because when I graduated, we're still doing graph paper and pencils and just went for it, right? And through a lot of hard work and effort and persistence and time and support from so many amazing people within the tribe that have helped us along the way, we're still in business and we're gearing up for a pivotal study based on the strength of our clinical data from previous studies and working to get the product on the market, hopefully in early 2022. I love it too. Some of your partners on your website, actually, some of my friends, I know Neil Patel over at HealthBox and that you guys work with them. Nice. Wonderful organization. I know some of the leaders over at AdvaMed as well and MedTech Innovator. You have some great folks rallied around you, the team around the advisory board you have, and the other team members, fantastic. You mentioned that you're bringing it to market in 2022. When you say bring to market, how are you bringing that to market? Where are those entry points so our community can understand how you're viewing that and going about it strategically? Yeah, right now the basic plan is to come to the US first and then EU and other countries outside the US later. And so we have ISO certification. We do that, but just due to the changing landscape and the focus of effort, we're focusing on the US first because we'll also likely have some work to do on reimbursement. It's just to get regulatory approval as quickly as possible and then do a limited geographic launch with a few key sales reps in targeted areas as we continue to build evidence and prove out reimbursement and everything else for users and and grow that way. The call point right now is urology, right? It's all urologists. We've built a great network of urologists across the country. It's been amazing to work with them and so many phenomenal clinicians in that regard. And initially urologists we're talking to, but eventually clinics, we're able to support this with nurses as well, because nurses frequently deal with catheter exchanges for patients too. That's awesome. And towards the end, we'll ask you where we can find it online so our community can learn more about it, get involved, touch base with you, and to discuss the opportunities at hand with Eurodev Medical. Again, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But also, you have a few other tricks up the sleeve as we're getting ready for this interview. Derek, you mentioned this isn't going to be your last rodeo in regards to launching companies and solving for those opportunities in the marketplace that you and others have personally experienced. What else are you working on these days? Yeah, there's a few other companies that I've begun to support in addition to the nonprofits that I've been working with. And for the first five years of Eurodev Medical, right, I did nothing. I did nothing else and just focused to build this and to grow it. And I needed to do that. But now it's at a point where we brought in new leaderships. So we hired a new CEO with industry experience. Device design is frozen. We're in a fantastic place. Knowing myself and my unique skills and my desires and where I fit moving forward with the company. I absolutely can stick around and we'll continue to support and advocate for the company 100%. But there's no question that I'm not going to be as good at sales as someone who's been in urology sales or marketing. So we're bringing in people that can do these jobs better than me, which is a rewarding thing as an entrepreneur is when you build an organization sustainable and you implement processes that make it successful without you, right? That's kind of where we're at. We're working through this now. And like I said, we hired a new CEO almost six months ago, phenomenal guy and work through our pivotal study and we'll continue to raise more capital and grow the organization from there. But as we're doing that, have had the opportunity to explore other research collaborations and start other companies. And so the most recent one that's public is a very simple consumer electronics device with a healthcare application. It's a digital tool for skin inspection that we call the Habit Camera. And just recently did a soft launch for this product. It's available online at our website for pre-orders and we'll be launching and shipping units in about three or four months in Q3 of this year. And so this device is incredibly simple, yet very impactful. And I didn't invent it. The inventors are VA researchers at the Minneapolis VA. And I was fortunate to find them and meet them and to secure the license of the technology where we can bring it to market and help people with a variety of conditions like diabetes, peripheral artery disease, chronic limb ischemia, limited mobility conditions like wheelchair users, dermatological applications like acne and skin cancer screenings and everything else. But it's simple and low cost that we're hoping that it will help a lot of people once it's out in the marketplace. The main point, the selling point is just that it's more ergonomic and more effective than a mirror. And it also supports telehealth. It's just a simple digital camera that wirelessly connects to a smartphone app and enables you to see things in high definition while saving images or video that you can then send to your clinicians, caregivers, family, friends by text or email if you spot any areas of concern. And the the key selling point again is just that for these wounds, which can be life-threatening for so many people, early intervention and inspection and frequent inspection is way more effective than trying to recover once they become debilitating 
or life-threatening or require amputation or other very invasive surgical means to treat. Well, thanks for sharing that. It sounds like an exciting horizon as well with the other companies and other technologies that you're bringing to market. Then, of course, you're also giving back to the community that you have grown up in and you've given dedicated your early career to, and that is veterans in our nation. I want to talk a little bit because I think it's important. I'm very passionate about what the missions you are on with MedTech Vets. Can you highlight that a bit? Share with our community what's happening there with your nonprofit. Absolutely. MedTech Vets is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we have a very simple mission, and that's to help veterans find meaningful careers and employment in the med tech and life science industry. We offer a free program to help these veterans transition. And it's very intensive. They do the curriculum over the course of about three months. And we work with them and provide mentors and help them build a network and research companies and identify strategies to implement, to find employment with any companies that they want to be a part of and offer their services to. It's a win-win for everybody. And it's something that I'm very passionate and fortunate to be a part of. Veterans are phenomenal employees and phenomenal leaders and value add for any organization. But the thing that we find is that they're inspired by causes that they can get passionate about and get on a new mission, right? We find that and it's very easy line to draw in med tech where the actions you take actually help people on a daily basis and your product helps people or else you won't be in business very long. Very simple. We just help veterans go through this curriculum. And then on the back end, we leverage our network of industry partners to help mentor them and guide them. And with the ultimate goal of them gaining employment and staying employed at these companies. Yeah, it's so exciting. I can attest to that, Derek. Our founder and CEO at Olive, where my day job, if you will, I'm not a full-time podcaster quite yet. As I mentioned to you, is working up to this episode recording with you. I absolutely love podcasting because I get to spend time and learn from leaders like you and where things are going with the healthcare industry. But My full-time opportunity over at Olive, our founder and CEO is a veteran himself and uh, is wildly passionate about it as well. And man, has he created one heck of a company in Olive. We're now valued at over $1.5 billion. We're building the internet of healthcare and we are mission and passion driven over here at Olive. Couldn't agree more with you. A lot of great things in regards to our veterans and what they can bring to this industry. In a moment, again, we're going to ask where we can find all of this wonderful work online. But before we go there, Derek, in regards just to kind of in totality of what you've been working on, you mentioned, of course, you are that patient. You are that end user that you mentioned it, that that is your competitive and unique skill set and strength in the marketplace. Where do you see things heading for you and the organizations and the companies and technologies that you're building into the future? Give us an old, say, two to three, three to five year horizon. Where are things heading for you? Yeah. One of the things that I'm most excited about and what I'm seeing, and you guys are probably, I may even be late to the party to the integration of remote patient monitoring, software, telehealth, all these sorts of initiatives and potential value that they can add with traditional medical devices. I think that's an area that I'm becoming more and more passionate about. And I think it's going to be one of the biggest opportunities for growth and change. And we kind of recently experienced this through the pandemic, but I think there's also a lot of fundamental and structural changes that still need to occur to make this mainstream and to adopt this mainly on the policy side with things like reimbursement and the incentive structure regarding all of that. Really excited to see where things go there. That was one of the things we've been working through with Habit Camera, obviously. It enables and facilitates telehealth. I've been talking to podiatrists, dermatologists, all of these other clinicians that previously were unable to bill for telehealth, but now are as creating efficiencies for everybody, for the patients, for the clinicians, for the providers and the payers. That's something I'm really excited about. And I think as I move forward, most of the companies that I will devote my time and energy to. Hopefully, we'll be able to take advantage of those trends and the value that they'll create in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it is amazing what this pandemic has done to accelerate telehealth or other innovations. I mean, I've said this time and again on the podcast, look at the whole experience that we've had with vaccines, just an unbelievable moment in time on innovation. I think we're going to look back one day and just look at that and just be mesmerized of how fast we moved with mRNA technology to get these vaccines from a novel virus we didn't even know about. And then just about a year later, vaccinating people around the world. I mean, that's just a mind-blowing feat of human ingenuity. And mentioned as well, telehealth, other technologies, other innovations that have compressed cycles that were going to take years, maybe decades. But now things are being unleashed because of this devastation. Yes, it has been a brutal experience with this pandemic. But I also see, and it sounds like you're there as well, there are going to be phoenixes that rise from these ashes to help us move to a better environment for healthcare. 
that is going to hopefully bring better health to our communities across this nation. And it sounds like you're going to continue to lead the forefront there, Derek. I remain incredibly excited and confident because of leaders just like you moving our industry forward. With that, also, Derek, let's talk a little bit of how we can be helping you. What is one problem, need, or question that you have, your companies have, something that we can be thinking about to be helping you with? What's one problem, need, or question that you have? The majority of the challenges and what I've spent a lot of time recently diving into are focused around reimbursement and trying to become an expert and navigate the landscape and the policies there. And one of the companies I'm affiliated with has obtained breakthrough device designation, which previously wasn't a major deal, but with some of the recent legislation for Medicare and the MCIT legislation, which was supposed to enable immediate reimbursement for these devices, that was something that would have been transformative for the industry. For all the listeners out there, if they're not already on this bandwagon or haven't already researched it or haven't already talked with their congressmen and any avenues they have to CMS for this I would ask you to look into it and try to understand it. But the change single-handedly could have a massive, massive impact on the entire innovation ecosystem and make the U.S. the primary place for innovative medical devices that are truly breakthroughs for Americans, right? And this is a great thing, but because we're bureaucrats and politicians and for whatever reason, they're stalling, right? And Medicare is stalling and they've delayed it and reopened it for public comment and My fear, I don't know, I'm not in Washington, I don't know this, but my fear is that it may never get enacted, right? Which could be a huge missed opportunity, I think, for everybody. That's one thing. And then on the other side, I'm still working through all the avenues of telehealth reimbursement and different things for the habit camera to understand, like I was talking about with podiatrists, dermatologists, rehabilitation settings, PMR docs, everybody else to understand best ways to commercialize and who to charge, right? Whether we want to go direct to consumer, which is what we're currently planning to do. And like I said, it's available for pre-order on our website now or if it's better for clinicians to potentially provide this to their patients because it enables them to increase access to care and reimbursement. So that's a lot of stuff that I'm working through right now and definitely appreciate any support from the community or or connections there. Well, in order to offer up that support, we need to be able to get a hold of you, of course, Derek. So where are some contact points online, social media handles, websites, or otherwise? Where can we find you? Yeah, too easy. I have a personal website, which is just DerekHerrera.com. My email is Derek at DerekHerrera.com. Really simple. That's me personally. You send me an email, I'll get it and I will do my best to respond. And that's easy. You can also check out the companies I mentioned and the organizations, Eurodev Medical, that's U-R-O-D-E-V medical.com, medtechvets.org, which is M-E-D-T-E-C-H vets.org and Habit Camera, which is www.habit.camera. And then obviously I'm on, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm using Facebook less and less. <laughs> and then also on Clubhouse too. So I'll definitely connect you on Clubhouse, Mike, and hopefully attend some of the sessions you're hosting soon. Oh, absolutely. Clubhouse has been a blast. We'll have to convene over there and have some real-time chat as well. By the way, well played on the habit.camera. Way to leverage that dot camera <laughs> URL. Well done, my friend. And of course, for our community, we'll leave all those contact points in the episode notes. So simply just scroll down in your favorite podcast player you're listening to this podcast with and click on through to get a hold of Derek and his teams, as well as head over to our global free online community, passionatepioneers.com. There will be a post for Derek's episode where you can also leave comments, questions, feedback for Derek and his team and find those contact points for him and all of his organizations again over at passionatepioneers.com. All right, Derek, we are going to start wrapping it up here. Close it down. You have a lot to get to. You probably have to get back to those three and a half year old twin boys as well. I know that's a lot of work in and of itself, but man, that's awesome. Again, thank you for sharing about your family on the front end. So cool. We have a fill in the blank to finish it out. And it's, I'm a passionate pioneer because? Because I want to improve life through innovation. I love it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Derek. And you're doing exactly that. You're bringing the heat. You are doing an incredible job with all the organizations. You're moving forward. Big fan of your work. I'm absolutely grateful to be able to spend some time with you, Derek. And of course, I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Thank you for serving our country. And of course, as another industry expert and passionate leader in this space, thank you for bringing your mind share, your passion and determination to the healthcare industry and everything you're helping lead the charge on. But for now, Derek, again, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It is an absolute honor, my friend. Pleasure's all mine. No, thank you so much. And yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. 
We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.